Okay, thank you for the introduction. So, as Anna Maria said, I'm here to in place of uh, Vladan that couldn't come. And I'm going to tell you about how we're trying to use and control all total interactions in Atom for applications in quantum metrology. So I will start by thanking everyone that worked on this project. It's kind of a long-standing project. We already have, are starting the third generation of uh, grad student. Some of them are here and they just graduated. And I also put our nearest neighbor uh, in lab. It's where basically we jump in when we need some mirrors, some glasses, some something that we don't have in our lab. But also because there is some interesting fact that has been observed there. It's, it's an excursus, so it's a Rydberg lab. And what you have to know here is that at some point we had to load as many as possible Rydberg, uh, sorry, uh, rubidium atom in a dipole trap. And to do that, since now there is a machine learning, AI, and everything, we try to implement to tell a computer to optimize parameters for loading from mod to the dipole trap uh, in the best possible way. We went for lunch. When we came back, we got a PC. Uh, it's, it's a small one. It's just uh, uh, kind of 200 atoms. But it was kind of interesting that we observed something like this, that the computer could find a PC just by loading atom in a, in a dipole trap. But there is also a part of, uh, let's say, humanity in this discovery, it's that actually when we aligned everything, we didn't do a good job. So the dipole trap was kind of, uh, the beam coming out down here was kind of clipped, and so it was creating some dimple in the focus here, and actually when the machine, the computer was trying to optimize the atom number, at some point uh, it could get enough atoms that there was some condensate. So ju that just to say that apparently AI is useful to optimize everything, but Grad student and postdocs are always will be always useful, especially if they do happy mistakes. <laughs> so, okay, and this also it's anyway some kind of like induced stuff, so it's related with my talk. So now we go back to the main topic. Uh, I'll start with the outline, just very general what atom atomic sensors are and what is a quantum metrologist, just to give a kind of overlook. Then. I will speak about entanglement on an Ethereum optical clock that uh, we did in our lab. That's the, our first application. And then I will introduce a new paradigm that we investigate uh, experimentally. And I will give you more details, of course, later. So let's start. Atomic sensors, in general, can be considered as just a spin one half uh, uh, atom system, just to simplify the things. And what we're trying to do is to measure uh, the separation in energy and this separation in energy depends on some parameters that we want to measure. And we can split our protocol in three steps. What I show here is a Ramsey protocol. We prepare atomic state, we let the state evolve, and then we measure the final state. At the end, the phase that is uh, it's accumulated here is just proportional to the difference between our local oscillator and the actual frequency related to the energy separation between the two levels. If we do this with a single atom, uh, that creates some problems because when we try to measure our final state, we can get just a two outcome. Or the atom is measured spin up or is measured spin down. So at the end, you have an uncertainty in your phase that's pretty large, it's one radians. So what we do, not we, everyone does, usually use many two level atom system. And this can be mapped to a spin and half system. And here it appears a new kind of uh, block sphere, that's a generalized block sphere, where the collective state of the atom is represented in this case by this blob here, which is a coherent state here, and it's uh, uh, just the Wigner function of this thing. In that case, then when we perform our measurement, our sensitivity is limited by the width of the projection of this blob here, which is joined with 1 over square root of n. If we can reach a sensitivity that's like this, that's a so-called standard quantum limit that you cannot go beyond that if you don't use uh, quantum entanglement or quantum correlation within the atoms. So actually a better picture of the protocol is basically when we use this generalized block sphere, when we have a set of state, it's a collective state, the phase is accumulated, and then we measure the final state. That's the projection. So atomic sensors, there are many kind of them. Uh, there are magnetometers where they measure magnetic fields. And if you use atoms, you have 10 to the 10, 10 to the 11 atoms. 
So it's a pretty large number, so your uncertainty that goes with 1 over square root of n, it's pretty small. But if you use some artificial atom like uh, NV centers, you can go down to a single spin. So at some point, you may be limited by uh, projection noise. You can have uh, electric field meters, where they use kind of the same number of atoms as here. You can have gravimeter, atometer ferrometers, where the numbers start to decay to, to 10 to the 6. And then you have optical clocks that are ideally sensitive to nothing. So that's the, 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 the splitting, so that you measure time. And you usually have between 1 to 10,000 10, atoms. One when you're using ions, 10,000 when you have a nice uh, optical uh, lattice trap. And why you cannot put many more atoms is because these devices are pretty sensitive. And if you have too many atoms, they start to collide. And then you have effects that you do not want to have if you're trying to do metrology. You may want if you're trying to understand how a many body quantum system happen, uh, works. So of course, improving metrology can have a huge impact and opens up to many new opportunities, both in applied uh, stuff like just defining time standard, for example, or navigation or localization. But also, it can allow you to observe in our, how it works, our world, with uh, new eyes. Uh, here's just a couple of examples. So and now I will introduce very rapidly quantum metrology. This is what you can do if you prepare your state the best of your capacity. So you're limited by the standard quantum limit. But if before starting your sensing time, you generate some entanglement within the atoms, you can actually create a state that's potentially more sensitive to phase uh, changes than uh, a coherent state. And to do this, you need your atoms to evolve under a nonlinear Hamiltonian, basically get atom-atom uh, interaction so that they can, you can generate this collective entangled state. This is a squeeze state, what I'm representing here, but you can generate any kind of state you would like to have. Of course, this requires atom-atom interaction. But as I kind of said before, when you're doing sensing, you don't want to have any atom-atom interaction. So we need some switch. We need to be able to turn on, on demand, the interaction, and turn it off when we don't want to use it. And well, it's kind of intuitive that if you want to switch on and off something, the first thing you think of is light. So it may be nice if we could generate atom-atom uh, interactions that are light mediated. And in our lab, we do that by putting atoms in a cavity, because in that case, then uh, the atom-light interaction, it's pretty large, and so it's also easy to get an atom-atom interaction. And everything with the goal to go below that limit here. Okay, so the system in our case, as I mentioned, is an Ethereum optical clock. Uh, we use Ethereum 171 atoms. Uh, we usually load between 100 to 10,000 atoms, depending a little bit on the experiment we are doing. And this is roughly our experiment. Atoms are loaded and coupled to a cavity mode. And the question is why we use Ethereum. Well, it has an interesting optical clock transition. It's 7 milliards. It's very narrow. It has a Q factor that ex exceeds 10 to the 15. And in recent experiment, uh, not in our lab, but actually they could reach kind of fantastic uh, stabilities that are essentially limited by the projection noise. So in that case, in this kind of platform, is one of the state-of-the-art platform for detecting very uh, small signals. And it also reached the standard quantum limit. Another interesting uh, Sorry, is that, feature. Is that yeah. a fermion version? It's a fermion, yes. It's a fermion version. Yes, it's a fermion, and since it's a fermion, it has actually a nice uh, feature. It's that for Ethereum 171, uh, we have a ground state that is a spin one out system. So everything is simple there, and you can use this as a nice playground for uh, quantum mechanics. Uh, there is uh, this transition that uh, has a line width of 200 kilohertz, which is not good for uh, optical clocks, but it's still pretty narrow. and what is really important here is that the ground state is a nuclear spin. So you apply a strong magnetic field. You have a very small Seaman splitting. In our case, we apply uh, 14 Gauss, and we get a splitting of uh, 10 kilohertz. So it's 1.4 millitesla, 10 kilohertz. While in this transition here, it's 
mostly electronic spin, <coughs> the splitting is going to be 20 megahertz. So, and it's much larger than the, than the gamma. So actually we have an effectively closed transition. We can think about uh, our system as effectively a, a spin, a three level system. And we can use this one to perform many things. And we, what we do, for example, is, well, we move S and P, but to give space for a cavity, we tune our cavity to be resonant with this transition. And what happens when we have a cavity that's resonant with a transition like this, we scan the laser through the cavity, the laser frequency here. What we observe, it's a rabbit splitting. It's going to be two mode. And the splitting here is proportional to the number of atoms that are in the spin up state. So we can use this scan, this splitting, to get informa gain information about the collective atomic state. This is how we measure the projection of our state at the end uh, in the ground state, the projection along, uh, along Z. So this is how we measure, that's interesting. But we want to generate also entanglement. And we do this using the same apparatus. We have atoms in the cavity. And what we try to do first is to generate uh, one axis statistic Hamiltonian. That's basically just a uh, Hamiltonian that depends on SZ square. SZ square is, SZ is the collective uh, SZ operator that can also be seen in this form, where you notice that there is an all-to-all -all interaction. Every atom in the ensemble interacts in the same way with all other atoms. So the question is how we generate this. So we can have an intuitive understanding. If we send the light that's slightly detuned from uh, the atomic transition, the light goes into the cavity. It's non zero around here. The probability that light goes into the cavity. When there is light in the cavity, Adam sees a light that's detuned from their transition, right? So they will experience a light shift. That's what I see here. If they, exper they experience a light shift, that's like a magnetic light Hamiltonian that's proportional to the intensity of the light inside the cavity. So it's proportional to the number of photons that enters the cavity. And then there is a cavity that does the, the magic here. The intensity is proportional to SZ, to the collective uh, SZ state. This can be seen, for example, on, on the rabbit peak. If you are slightly detuned here, you can see that when you have a little bit more atoms in the spin-up states, so you have a larger SZ value. Uh, there is more light to split thing opens up, so there is more light entering the cavity. So this means that actually the atoms inside the cavity will feel a magnetic field that's effective magnetic field that's proportional to the Z itself of, uh, of the ensemble itself. So if they are a little bit above the equator, they experience a positive uh, rotation. If they're below the equator, they experience a negative direction. So this will just induce a shearing force. And if you shear a circle, you will get an ellipse. And this, you get a squeeze state. And if we zoom in and we remove the Broxford curvature and everything, basically you end up with a state like that. So the question is how, first of all, do we see if there is any squeezing? Because in, with this kind of Hamiltonian, the, it's not changing any value on SZ. So if you just generate squeezing, the shearing, and then we measure the variance along the SZ so we repeat the experiment many times. We just observe the same variance as the standard quantum limit, which gives you one if you normalize it correctly. But what we do, we apply a rotation. It's uh, in the ground state. So we rotate. We get squeezing because the, the, the thing is aligned in the right direction. And then at some point, we see also the anti-squeezing. We, we put this state vertical. and. Uh, it's easy to rotate because here we are in the, within the two Zeeman sublevel in the ground state, and it's just a 10 kilohertz RF field that uh, anyone can produce with the right coils. Of course, when we do this, we are limited anyway by uh, the measurement resolution of our system. We are not able to detect every single atom. We just see the collective state, and also we are not able to resolve any single DT level, so we cannot count SZ without uncertainty. There is some uncertainty, and this is our limitation that we have here. So we apply this to uh, our system, and here we generate the squeezing with this technique within the two uh, Zeeman sublevels in the ground state. 
which is nice and interesting, but it's also maybe not so smart because this is effectively a magnetometer that is almost not sensitive to magnetic field. So it's not very smart, but we wanted to do to have actually a squeezing on the clock transition. So the idea that we have is that uh, we read in some paper actually is that uh, you generate the squeezing here and then with a coherent pi pulse in the right direction, you can transfer one of the population in the clock transition and then actually effectively mapping the squeezing from the ground state to the excited state. So here are the results when we did the squeezing on the ground state. We observe is a tomography of our state. Uh, the rotation is shown in a logarithmic scale because this deep is pretty narrow, so it's much easier to see it if we do it on logarithmic scale. So we observe a squeezing, and we observe also some under squeezing appearing up here. So in the ground state it works. Then we transfer everything. We first need to see if we can transfer the population in a coherent way from the ground state to the excited state, and then eventually bring them back. That's what we tested here. This is uh, basically just a Rabi spectroscopy uh, on the clock transition, and here it's a Rabi flopping. We can transfer up to 90 to 93 percent of atoms coherently in the clock transition, and then bring them back in the ground state. So we did that. We transferred the atom in the clock transition. We transferred them back. And then we detect in the ground state because it's easier and the coherence time here it's infinitely long for our, our, our experiment. And what we observe is that actually the profile of the tomography is unchanged. If we transfer the atoms up and down from the clock transition or we just observe the atoms directly in the ground state, there is no change. So this means that this process is at least not introducing any extra noise, which is good. Of course, we have to test if we still have for example, if this squeezing can stay there for a long time. So what we did here, we generated our squeezing, we put it horizontal. Horizontal in the block sphere means that we are not sensitive to phase, so we are not sensitive to a very bad optical clock that we actually had. And we transfer the, uh, the, the squeeze state on the clock transition. We wait there for long enough, for some time, up to, well, I think 500 milliseconds is the longest we tried. And then we bring them back and measure the variance. So this, basically the variance remains below the standard quantum limit of the solid circle uh, forever, in our, at least up to uh, one second. But if we consider the contrast, we see that there is a contrast loss. So the actual meteorological gain that we can get, it's a bit less. It's the open square data here. It stays below the standard quantum limit, which is one here, for more or less 200 milliseconds then it kicks up, but it's still below what you could do if you start everything with a coherent state and then you consider the contrast loss also there. So this for us was enough to, to say, well, uh, the entanglement, so the squeezing, survived long enough on the clock transition so that could be used for real clock applications. So we tried to do that. Uh, unfortunately, we had a bad clock and a bad optical clock. I can tell you the little bit of the story why. So here you can notice that's maybe 10 to the minus 13, the stability. And this is not the full clock operation. I will specify it later. Uh, while good people with clocks can get a fraction of stability in 10 to the minus 17 per root hertz or lower, the issue is that uh, we have our lab, we have our clock, a uh, laser. We did as all things as good as we could. And then we have fibers, right? Going from one table to another, coming back and so on. And at some point, we had some visitor from NIST, I guess. And we asked, oh, but are you, fiber I mean, are you stabilizing your fibers? Say, no, no, there is no need for that. Say, OK, so let's take the measurements. So we took all the measurements. And well, it's really bad. So we were a little bit unhappy with how we were locking the laser with the ultra-stable cavity. Well, it turns out that when we asked these questions, the, the other person thought that we were thinking, speaking about maybe half a meter or one meter of fiber. But actually, we have something like in total 30 meters or more fibers. So we had to do fiber stabilization, but we didn't. And so that's why we have a very bad clock. But nevertheless, when we measure everything, we try to do our experiment and run the clock with a coherent state, so it's blue data here, and with a squeeze state as input. After we remove all the local oscillator noise that we could, it was there, so we could characterize it because we could measure the noise from the local oscillator. We could remove that component. We could see that actually we observe a, a squeezing below the standard quantum limit of 4.4 dB. This is the contribution coming only from atoms. It's not the squeezing on the clock. 
may look not a lot. I mean, if with a good clock, you could get this improvement. It may look not a, a lot because actually 4.4 is a 2.8, but it's, it means that you need actually, you can integrate, you can reach certain stability or precision in your measurement 2.8 times faster, which if you compare it to your salary, if you multiply it by 2.8 you, to your salary, you may change the perspective and, and work. <laughs> or also in the opposite direction. So what, what, what is important? Is it delta mu over mu in the vertical? Yes. Yes, yeah, sorry. That's a fraction of, uh, yeah, I think I put a white square to remove something. And I, <laughs> yes. And at the end, this, everything was limited by our final state readout. So now I will introduce you a new paradigm. Uh, that we uh, experimentally demonstrated and used and developed a little bit. And on this case, all the experiments are done just on the ground state, of, uh, so in this, uh, within the two Siemens of levels. So no optical clocks so far, but maybe applied later. So now we'll uh, have a little bit of a small cartoon. So remember, the, the improvement <laughs> is limited by the final state readout. So in general, sensor performance is characterized by its signal-to-noise ratio. Here I have some car, two cars in, uh, in uh, New York and uh, Manhattan, actually, and I want to target one of these cars, and I'm using a very bad GPS, so I cannot see the two cars. One way to identify where is my car is to reduce the noise. That's what you do when you do spin squeezing. You reduce the noise, so your signal-to-noise ratio increases. It's great. But is that the only way to improve the signal-to-noise ratio? Well, it's not. And uh, to demonstrate this one, you should move here in Boston, where they build streets in a very highly nonlinear way. <laughs> so, and you have an alternative now, now here. You can try to reduce to improve the uh, sensitivity of your uh, GPS, or you just wait a moment and let the system evolve under this nonlinear Hamiltonian. And actually, you will see the two cars that one ends up going towards Seattle and the other one ends up in Logan. So you wait a little bit and you let the system evolve under this nonlinear Hamiltonian, and you can actually distinguish where the two cars are. Okay? So in that case, I increase the signal and I increase the signal to noise ratio. Now there is a problem because all, all I put here uh, was classical noise, just our readout noise, for example. But if my limitation is the quantum noise, this is why I have a cat. But I think I'm better than Heisenberg because it's not going to die, this one. It's just the localized in many street. If I let the system evolve under this nonlinear Hamiltonian, I have the two cars slightly split out. They will end up basically being delocalized everywhere. So there is a huge increase of the uh, spread of this car, right? So the noise increases a lot. And that's not a surprise because when you do quantum mechanics and you have some unitary evolution, if two states are, have a certain overlap at the beginning, you let them evolve under this, this unitary evolution, the, the overlap stays the same. So the question is, can I use this amplification in quantum mechanics? Uh, if we go and look at something a bit more uh, realistic, the answer will be yes. And so if I have something classical, and I have just my SZ squared Hamiltonian as I had before, it's a nonlinear Hamiltonian, I have a certain displacement delta. If I let the system evolve a little bit, I will get a displacement at some point that it's larger than delta, and this is what we saw earlier, so I can amplify my signal somehow. And quantum mechanics doesn't work very well because even if I have an improvement in the signal in this direction, the, my noise increases also a lot. But if I can reverse the time in my system after I introduce the signal, Actually, I can get a, 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 I can amplify this signal a lot, and I can get basically the same noise here, but a larger signal. So I could increase the signal to noise ratio by reversing the time of my system. Reversing the time of my system is a cool way of saying I'm just changing the sign of the Hamiltonian. So the question is then, how can I reverse the sign of my Hamiltonian in my system in an easy way? So in my system, uh, remember, are just atoms inside the cavity. And when they, there is light on, they evolve under this nonlinear Hamiltonian. This is the sketch we had before. It's a light shift, and I get a certain shearing. If I detune the light on the opposite side, I can have the intensity being always proportional to the SZ. 
but have a light shift that has the opposite sign. And so in this case, I will shear in the opposite direction. So shearing in the opposite direction is basically just putting a minus in front of the Hamiltonian, and I can actually undo my, my revolution. And this is the experiment, finally. Uh, we start with a coherent state. We measure, we apply a pi half pulse, and we measure actually the uh, a Z projection. But if we remove the pi half pulse, it's just equivalent to measuring just SY direction. That's in this case, we just measure the SY direction, so the horizontal projection. Nice and Gaussian. We let the system evolve under this SZ square Hamiltonian, and we see that the noise grows. Sorry, still grow. It grows, and at some point, it starts to wrap around the generalized block sphere, so we cannot have a spin vector that changes uh, in value. So it wraps around, it starts to look non Gaussian anymore, and actually, at some point, you have something that is kind of completely wrap around the block sphere, so you get distribution like this one. And then what we do, we say, okay, now let's change the frequency of the light. Let's detune the light on the other direction and let the system evolve backwards in time. And we can recover from this state. We can go back to a uh, uh, Gaussian distribution again, nearly uh, limited by the coherent state size, so the standard quantum limit. It's a little bit wider. It's just a factor of two invariance larger because our system is not perfectly closed. So there is some, some losses, but that's kind of working, at least in terms of noise, we can reduce the noise. So one can always argue, yes, but where is the signal here? Uh, and can also, I mean, one way of getting some Gaussian distribution is to thermalize everything. So to show that it's not the case, we do the same process, we evolve forwards in time, then you introduce a signal, and then evolve backwards in time. In that case, we were interested then in the mean point, because we know that the noise goes back to the coherent state. So here we measure the the expectation value of SY, I mean, the average uh, SY measurement that we obtain divided by SZ, as a function of the rotation that we put in inside. So the black lines represent the standard, uh, the best you can do when, with uh, a Rams interferometer. If you introduce a rotation of 0 0.1 radians, you will observe a poster, uh, a poster rotation of 0 0.1 in the right direction. And here we see then that our signal is clearly amplified by a decent factor here is amplified by three, four, it goes up to five times larger. And then at some point we will have losses and everything starts to shrink and, and so on, but there is some amplification. So in that case, then we can define our metrological gain. That is just the amplification square divided by the normal, normalized variance. Um, if you get one, you basically sit uh, on this purple line, which means that you have the same uh, sensitivity as uh, the standard quantum limit. And this, of course, it changes for atom number, but here we look at different atom numbers, how much we can improve. Uh, here, the red data are our data here. We see that by increasing the atom number, the gain that we can get beyond the standard quantum limit improves with an Heisenberg scaling, so improves with uh, the number of atoms proportionally. So we're sitting kind of 12.6 dB away from the Heisenberg limit, and at most we could load 430 atoms uh, in average in our system and get an improvement of 13 dB. 13 dB is 20 times better than rotation. And here, just we compare this data uh, with all, not all, but <laughs> a good fraction of uh, squeezing that has been performed, or uh, actually entanglement, that has been performed in uh, many body systems to improve metrology. So we have blue uh, BCs experiments, where you have SZ square interaction for free. It's hard to turn it off, but that you can. Uh, red data are ultra cold atoms, but still thermal. Some of them it's even hot. And here is the regular holder where they could get 20 dB, uh, 17 dB actually in, uh, with 1 million of atoms. And grayish data here, dark one are um, ions. This is single ion chains. Uh, they got some uh, nice GSZ state. This one is, I think, John Bollinger. It's a very a similar, very similar uh, system, very mathematical at least, very similar to ours with ions. And here it's a tweezer array of neutral atoms. So this is interesting because you can extrapolate and you could get quite good improvement in new sensitivity. And what we try to do is, let's see if we can improve the sensitivity of our very bad magnetometer. So 
we try to be phase sensitive in this case. We create our squeeze state or highly entangled state, put it vertical to be sensitive to phase, and measure. So the standard quantum limit stays on the standard quantum limit. That's great. And when we did it with our protocol, we got an improvement of factor of 15. And in this case, it's too obvious if I tell you that's 15, it's a lot for your salary. So I can tell you if you need to measure something with a certain accuracy and you need 60 years to do that, it's a whole life project. Well, with this improvement in integration time, it's just a PhD project. So things can be, become more interesting. And well, we try to go a little bit farther and try to generate uh, entanglement uh, exponentially fast because with this method, with the time reversal, we see that we can actually have a huge improvement. But to generate this kind of entanglement, usually you need to wait longer and longer so that the system evolves. So it would be nice if there is something that evolves exponentially fast so you don't have to wait too long to reach a very highly entangled state. And the trick to do that in our system is just to add a global rotation. It's very much similar to uh, uh, we use the Lipke Meshkov click Hamiltonian in this case. It's very much this analogous to uh, I think uh, transverse Ising model. And in that case, the dynamics changes completely. For certain parameters, there is this point here, which reminds of Boston, but. If you look at it classically, it's a saddle point. It's actually the uh, inverted uh, pendulum. And classically, so if you have a small displacement along these two lines, actually these two points goes away exponentially fast. So we try to do it uh, with our quantum system. We just put our coherent state on this crossing point here. And we see that what it should happen is that it generates entanglement exponentially fast. We get squeezing, <coughs> but since uh, our detection is not so good to detect all this small feature and so on. What we did, we let the system evolve. We know how to reverse, uh, introduce the signal, and then we know how to reverse uh, this Hamiltonian because as this square we are able to reverse. To reverse the rotation is quite easy. You just rotate in the other direction. And so we could detect a metrological gain in the system that grows exponentially fast. Here is the gain we got versus the time we expose the system to the, this nonlinear Hamiltonian. Of course, this is in dB scale. That's why we have a line. And uh, at the end, basically, this is an ex two experiments. One when we didn't apply any, uh, any displacement, any signal. One with displacement signal, we could reconstruct our uh, Wigner function and look at the overlap. So uh, I will reach the end with a summary. So light-induced all-to-all interactions uh, are a good uh, resource for quantum metrology, especially if you can control it well, because you can turn it off. So we demonstrated that uh, you can generate metrologically useful entangled state in optical clocks using this technique. Uh, in that case, the performance at the end was limited by the local oscillator noise and by the uh, projection noise of our measurement. And now uh, I think I may have convinced you that this new paradigm uh, where we can reverse, can reverse uh, the, the nonlinear evolution is kind of appealing because it makes, it's quite robust. It allows you to get a lot of uh, improvement. And actually, it renders many, maybe many other uh, scrambling Hamiltonian, Hamiltonian to generate entanglement in a very weird way, maybe, but exponentially fast. It could be useful and used also for metrology. And of course, as the outlook is, well, we use this technique on optical clocks. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you for the great, great talk. Um, we are open for questions. Maybe let me start. Yes. So the icing Hamiltonian is particularly tolerant to to the noise that, I mean, if you don't have any spin flips, then you can get one over n, even with the coherence and with super radians, but, uh, or uh, light uh, uh, decay from the cavity. But when you go and you introduce the rotation, you become much more, even yes. though you are exponentially fast, yes. if they, if you get much more one over square root of nc instead of nc. So you think that you can win then, or why? What is the gain there? Yes. Um, that's true. That's one of the reasons why here uh, we I, I cut. Actually, the things are going down later in this result here. 
um, uh, we have a way to optimize it, but uh, to really win over the overall possible gain that you can get using this Hamiltonian, so the Eisen one, or the, as the square Hamiltonian, in the idea case, is not clear. Actually, I think that as this square Hamiltonian is simple, one axis twisting, if you have a perfect thing, you can reach a GSZ state. Mm -hmm. uh, with this one, no. You need a two axis twisting. Mm -hmm. so. okay. But here you may win in terms of a speed. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Susan? So if you could choose any Hamiltonian that you wanted, um, um, when somebody tells you, OK, I give you a time reversal tool, yes. what would you do? Uh, we'll just try it directly do? here. <laughs> Again? I, I will do this, this protocol. Just evolve it, get something. No, no, but what oh. Hamiltonian? Oh, oh which one? Oh, oh anyone. Oh. That's a good question. I don't know. I would start, first of all, with, let's say, why not SZ4? Why not? I mean, just simple stuff. Uh, actually, I would use maybe also two axis twisting, SZ square plus SX square. This is exponentially fast. Just to clarify, like, am I understanding right? Maybe like uh, following up the Susanna's question. So the, the Hamiltonian that you want, you want instability in your Hamiltonian, right? So that's I, that's actually where you see exponential uh, scrambling. That's yep. that's connection there. So you actually want like instability in your Hamiltonian when you're choosing. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Instability in in metrology can be called as sensitivity. Yeah, no, no, I mean, that's not obvious. Uh, yeah, uh, I mean, if you think in that way, uh, you, you can see as if something is not, is unstable, it's actually very sensitive to perturbation, which, yeah. More questions? No, no, there's one up there. Ah, okay. Uh, sorry, thanks. <laughs> uh, hi, uh, hi, great talk. Uh, I was wondering if you fix the local oscillator noise, what would be your uh, limit for squeezing with a cavity? Uh, and what would be limited by it? Okay. Um, well, just squeezing is our measurement resolution. Uh, if we have a perfect measurement resolution, then you'd be limited by um, the curvature of the block sphere. So this means that you continue to squeeze, and you have two effects. One is you start to wrap around the block. I mean, both you wrap around the block sphere, so your signal decreases because actually your mean point is not anymore rotating on the block sphere surface. And another effect is that when you look at the projection along the squeeze direction, you will not have any more uh, a Gaussian distribution with a narrow thing. You have a narrow peak with some tails. <laughs> so you would need to use some more fancy way to extract all the information, which is not just the variance. Yes. Uh, if not, uh, if you do the time reversal, then in that case, it's very much the same limitation. It blocks with curvature, but it kicks in much later. Yeah, hi, um, I have a question regards you saying that you this is a cavity that you can turn the interaction on and off, right? And by sending the light or not. So how about the atoms interact with the vacuum mode of the cavity? That should be also very strong, right? Much less than when we release light. Yeah, yes. yeah, but uh, averagely the intra-cavity photon is not very large, right? So what's the difference between square root zero plus one, which is the vacuum, mm -hmm. or square root, for example, five photons in the cavity, five plus one, which is square root six, it's, it's not, much, not much different. Okay, trying to think how to answer that. And one way of saying this is that uh, you couple your atoms in with the cavity field, that's a bosonic field, right? And when you send in photons, you're actually driving your bosonic field. Right, and so this uh, grows uh, much faster than when you're not driving it. I don't know the numbers, but that's the way. <laughs> the, there is a possibility to generate squeezing with vacuum only, but, but it's too late for them. Yes, yes. Excellent, so I think we are ready for lunch. So let's thank the speaker. Thank you.
Yeah, lunch will again be 